Okay, title of the sermon this morning is Principles for the New Year. Principles for the New Year. I like to talk about uh, reflecting on goals um, because, you know, I like at the beginning of the year, you know, people are setting New Year's resolutions and thinking about the last year. And, uh, you know, when a year ends, um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like a, a funeral in the sense that, you know, when you go to a funeral, you think about life. You think about what your life is about. You think about how you're spending your time. You think about how short life is. And as every year passes and we get a year older, um, I'm always reminded of the same thing, you know, that life is short. We don't have a lot of time in this world, so we don't want to be wasting our life doing vain things. So I've got five principles I want to talk about in this sermon um, just to give you the right perspective. And some of them might just be reminders for some of you and others, uh, you know, might be some new things for you to consider as you think about the new year and setting goals. I like to sort of preach this prior to the new year, but obviously I was sick last week, so I couldn't uh, preach this for you, but still a good time to think about it. So we read through Psalm 90, and have you uh, sort of paying attention as you're reading through Psalm 90, uh, one of the themes going through Psalm 90 is really talking about the brevity and fragility of life. You know, there's a bit in there about God's wrath on his people in the Old Testament and things like that. It's actually a prayer of Moses. Uh, that's what the psalm starts off with. Some people don't believe it's a prayer of Moses, but that's obviously the, the title of the psalm in the King James Version, which is not actually inspired, you know, the, the title itself, not the text is inspired. But Psalm 90, you can see here that uh, it talks about the brevity of our life, gets us to reflect on that life is actually quite, sh- is, is very short. You know, life is over in the blink of an eye. You think the last year, you know, years just go and go and go. Every time we celebrate a church anniversary, I think, oh, okay, I'm planning, we're planning for the s- church's sixth anniversary. Six years. I mean, think about like when you first got married and you hear like, you know, you get married, a new couple, you hear somebody else has been married for like 10 years and you're like, whoa, I can't even imagine being married for 10 years, you know, and then oh, I'm married for 10 years. Here I am. I'm at the 10 year mark. So, you know, life just goes. I mean, I had the thought not long ago when I was thinking like my birthday's coming up because I was born, I'm born in January. I'm like, oh, I'm going to be 35. You know, you start getting that midlife crisis, like, 35, man, I'm 40. I'm going to get, I'm going to be 40 soon. I still feel like a kid. I still look like a kid. I'm actually 40. You know, like, remember when you were growing up and you were like, yeah, I don't don't know if you guys grew up in, like, church, but let's, you know, remember when you were a kid and then you used to, like, look at the parents and you think, oh, they were so old, you know, and it's like, I can't imagine being a parent, you know, because you're the kids just mucking around. And here we are, guys, we're the parents now. And sometimes I think, you know, I always want to tell you guys, you know, we're the parents now, our kids are going to be looking at us and they're thinking we're all. But then do we act like the parents? You know, do we act responsible, mature? Are we setting the example? Because out like you were that kid once, looking at how old the parents, you, knew, you, you remember being 10, 11, 12 years old, and you knew what was going on. You knew the phonies in church. You knew the people that were like, you know, oh, holy, 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 but then how they're not. Like kids can see through that, you know. So you've got to reflect on that, guys. You've got to be, be the parent that you want, you know, be the person that you want your kids to be because, you know, they're growing up. Remember when we all didn't have kids six years ago? Well, I had kids. All you guys didn't have kids six years ago. And you said to yourself, yeah, when I have kids, then I'll grow up and I'll be responsible. And now you've got kids. What's changed? Well, this is why it's, this sort of sermon is good. You've got to think, what has changed? What am I doing different? When I set my goals for something different this year. Life is short. Psalm 90. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Right? It's like saying like your life, it's like you could... You could you can sum up usually people's life in a, in a sentence, in a paragraph of what they were about. It's just talking about, you know, even though our life is 70, 80 years, yet you can sum it up like a tale. The days of our years are three score years, a score is 20 years, so three score years and 10 is saying 70. And if by reason of strength they be four score years. So you can see the Bible here is talking about the 
the, the, the normal lifespan of somebody, right? 70 to 80 years is our average lifespan. That's all we've got. Most of us are half of the way there. And if, we, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So this is alluding to God's uh, you know, anger at sin. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I know when I talk about you know, short life with Lewis, and Lewis will often say, you know, when you think about your life, you know, let's say you've, you've got 70 years, 80 years, and you say, oh man, I've only got 40 years left. I've only got 40 Christmas holidays left. Yeah. And when you number your days like that, you think, wow, I, I really don't have a lot of time on this earth. 40. Each year, one ticks away, uh, never to come back. Life is short. James 4, famous passage. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. There's a famous passage talking about the brevity of life. Every time we think about how short life is. Such an amazing picture here that just says, hey, your life is like that vapor. When you see it, like a, every time I look at the kettle and I see like, you know, the water boiling and the vapor coming out, I'm always thinking of this passage. You see it and it's gone. That's what life is like. It's here and the next minute it's gone. So don't waste your life. Don't waste the time that you have. You have so short amount of time. And I say this to myself as well. Like preparing this sermon, I'm just thinking like, these are the things I'm going to remind myself of. Like life is so short. I find myself like wasting so much time and uh, one day, you know, you, you can't get it back. You know, we, we waste all this time uh, just doing nothing, just, uh, just watching things on YouTube. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 12, look at what it says here. Because life is short, and this is just my intro really, just to sort of prepare you for, you know, the five principles I want to talk about. You've got to do things now. You know, the timing is never perfect. You'll never have it all together. You know, that's why you don't have, you don't have a lot of time. You should start now. There's always excuses not to do something. You know, I always joke. First, you're too young. And then you get old, you, you, you go to uni, you're studying, you start working... You get married, you got children, you got your career and business, you got, and then what's the excuse? I'm too busy now. Too busy with life, too busy to serve God, too busy to, to, to do something of value with my life, of eternal value. Right? And then what happens? Then too old. You know, let the young ends do it. You guys, you know, how many times have I heard you you, Victor, you got the energy to do that? Yeah, well, it's because people spend all their energy like doing work or whatever. So yeah, that's why you've got to think about your life and make sure you're investing time because it's too young, then you're too busy, then you're too old, and then what happens? You're too dead. I right? think you're too dead to do anything. It's too late. Right? So you've got to use the time that you have to serve God. Do something for God with your life. Remember now. See, not remember tomorrow. You know, everyone always goes soul winning next week. They always go soul winning next week. But next week, they go soul winning next week. And you never, they never end up going. And they do it next week. It's like when you're with your goals. I'll do it next year. I'll do it next week. Next week. That's why the Bible says, remember now thy creator. Today, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh. When thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Because right? one day you're going to have not as much energy as you had before. And that's why the Bible says, hey, that's why you've got to serve God while you're young. Serve God while you have energy. Serve God while you have the mindset. It's not I do everything and then once I've accomplished everything, then I serve God and give God the scraps of my life, the leftovers. Right? You, give, you could give God your best. You give God your best, your youth, your strength, your energy. And do something for God while you have the strength and the energy. So life is short. And I hope that as every year ticks over 
and every year passes that you think about this. You think about, man, a year just went. You think, oh, I can still remember when Victor preached about New Year's resolutions last year and the year before. It didn't feel like that long ago. That's how quick it goes. Have you ever, like, you know, sometimes, like, I'll preach a sermon and maybe, I don't know if you guys think this, because maybe because I'm preaching them that I pay more attention to, like, when I preach them. But I might preach on a topic and you feel like, man, didn't Victor preach this not long ago? But I generally don't preach things again unless it's been like a year ago. Or a year. So we, if you feel like the topics are getting like repetitive, that's just how quick time is going. You know, it's just going quick. It's just going again and again. I'm like preaching it maybe every year, every year and a half. But it's because time is fleeting. It's going. So here are, some, here are five things I just want you to think about when you think about what you're going to do this year the goals you're going to set, you know, the things you want to accomplish in your life. So five principles to think about for the new year. First one, and it kind of goes without saying. I mean, any Christian would know that this should be the first principle. But it's something we need to be reminded of, that God comes first. God comes first. Matthew twenty-two thirty-five. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The first and great commandment. God comes First, 1 Corinthians 10, look at this, verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now you hear this point and you think, duh, of course God comes first. Aren't we Christians? Isn't God meant to be the reason why we live? But that doesn't seem to be how most Christians live. I mean, do you live that way? Does God come first in everything you do? Do you consider God? When you are thinking about what you accomplished last year, what you are going to accomplish this year, you're sitting down, you're thinking, I'm going to do this. Did you even think about God? Like, do you have some spiritual goals? Like, do you have some goals about Bible reading? You know, hey, I want to read through my Bible this year. Or, you know, I want to read through at least half of my Bible this year. Like, do you have, did you have, do you have any goals like that? Because I'm sure everyone has career goals. Am I right? You know, if you're working, you're thinking, you know, you're studying, you're thinking about, you know, your career goals, what you want to achieve this year in career. You got what you want to achieve in business. Maybe you've got health goals, weight loss goals, things like this. You got game goals. You know, you want to improve in your games here and there. Or maybe you got travel goals. You say like this year. You know, now that maybe hopefully the COVID restrictions will be over, I'll be able to travel here, I'll be able to take that holiday and travel. Because I've got like, you know, these, you know, people have these maps planned out. I want to go here, I want to be able to go here. They, got, they set all these goals, travel goals. Food goals. You know, maybe they want to try certain foods. But do you have any spiritual goals? Did you, have, did you set some spiritual goals? Did you think about how much Bible... You want to get through this year? You know, if you haven't read through your Bible once before, hey, that's a good goal. Learn some more Bible. Do you have any soul-winning goals? You know, you go, hey, I'm at least going to go once this year. You know, I'm at least going to go once a month, once every six months. Maybe if you're a regular, you go like, hey, I'm going to make a goal. I want to at least give the gospel this time. You know, or I'm going to try and get at least one person saved. I want to see one person saved this time. If you go enough times, you'll see somebody get saved. See, do you have any ministry goals? You, know, you think about, hey, what do you want to do for God? God comes first. Does it mean like you can't do some things for yourself you know, that you want to achieve? Yeah, but they come second. They come third. They come fourth. So you need to make sure God comes first. And as rudimentary and as fundamental as that is, sometimes you just need to hear it again and be reminded that Hey, guys, the reason why you're on this earth, remember, it's for God. You know, sometimes we forget. 
Sometimes we think, you know, here I'm going to establish my legacy and build something for my kids and make sure I can retire early and all that. Hey, that's all, that's all nice and good, but that's not what life is about. Life is about winning people to the Lord Jesus Christ. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Right? So we don't want to go out gaining the whole world, not even be saved ourselves, but we don't want just, you know, gain the whole world and then the rest of the world go to hell as well. We want to get people to heaven. So God comes first. When you think about your goals for this year, did you consider spiritual goals? What are you going to do for God? Number two principle I want you to think about when you're setting goals and thinking about what you want to do this year and what you want to accomplish is, is to look forward. Look forward. Don't focus on the past. Right? Don't focus on what has already been done. Learn from the past, but focus on what's in front of you. Philippians 3, look at this. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Look forward. Right? And we see here, Paul is an example of like, why am I saying look forward? Because people often, when they think about what they're going to do, they get discouraged about the shortcomings and failings from the past. They think back and they think, oh, you know, I didn't get anything done last year, and they discourage themselves from doing anything this year. Or maybe they got into sin last year and they th think like, oh, you know, God can't use me, that sort of thing. So what I'm saying is, you know, what's done is done. You know, maybe, maybe you didn't accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. Maybe you did worse than you think you were going to do. Let's put the past behind us and let's just start afresh, new every morning, moving forward. Now, Paul is an example of like, say, an unbeliever who's done some really terrible things. Because right? you think about it, Paul as an unbeliever, persecuted the church, you know, he was murdering, murdered Christians, put him in jail. So he's thinking about, like, you know, if he just dwelt on his past, oh, look how terrible I am, God can't use me, that sort of thing. I mean, look at what he did for God. So you can see this is where Paul is coming from. When he thinks about, when he's talking about forgetting those things which are behind him, I mean, these are atrocious things that he has done, and yet... You know, when we think about our failings and shortcomings in the past, they are nothing in comparison to the things that Paul has done. Right? And yet, why do we let those things hold us back? Why do we let those things discourage us? Let's just confess it to God and just, you know, leave it in the past and move forward. Forget those things which are behind. Reach forth unto those things which are before. Don't let your past haunt you. You know, don't let your shortcomings and failings hold you you back from doing something great for God this year. John 21, here's it. So Paul, I think, is like an example of like an unbeliever. You know, you unbeliever, do things in an unbelieving state and then get saved. But you know, some Christians, they discourage themselves because they think, yeah, but Paul was an unbeliever. He did bad things when he didn't know Jesus Christ and all that. Yeah, well, here is Peter as a believer, you know, and, and, and him, you know, basically turning his back on the Lord Jesus Christ and I think he can encourage us because he became a great disciple as well, did great things for the Lord. But, you know, if he just dwelt on his past and just got discouraged and didn't do it, you know, then he might not have done the great things that he did. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter. So this is after Jesus is resurrected from the dead. The disciples had gone fishing, right? And Jesus appears to them at the shore. He says, cast the net on the other side. They cast it and the fish... They bring the fish to the shore and then Jesus is like cooking some fish for them, right? So you can imagine, they're sitting around this fire, they've dined, Jesus cooked the fish for them. That reminds me as well because, uh, you know, I remember speaking to a lady that was a Christian and she was like a vegetarian. And then I said, do you know that Jesus like, you know, cooked fish for his disciples? I always, I always think of that, uh, <laughs> I always remember that, uh, that story whenever I read this, that, that uh, situation. So when they had died, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? So what is he talking about? He's saying, he's saying to Simon Peter, when he's saying, lovest thou me more than these, he's saying, do you love going fishing? Because, he, because they're eating the fish. He says, do you love fishing? Do you love like, do, doing your worldly, secular, 
secular occupation more than serving the Lord Jesus. That's why he's saying, do you love us? He says, lovest thou me, the Lord Jesus Christ, more than fish, right? The material gain of fishing and his career and what they were. They were fishermen. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. So you see here, he's giving him direction moving forward. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. Why? Because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? Why was he grieved? Because you remember, Jesus said to Peter that he was going to deny him three times before the cock crowed. So he's like reminding, yeah, it's all right to think about the past and to learn from it, be reminded, but not to discourage you from moving forward, right? Because Jesus is reminding him, yes, okay, you did something wrong, but move forward, right? Feed my sheep. He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. So what is Jesus talking about? Verse 19 explains. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. So basically he's going to be captive and people are going to take him where he doesn't want to go. <coughs> this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had thus, and when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. So you see how he's looking forward, what he's going to do. He's not going to dwell on the past and discourage himself and just like quit, right? He's going to get back on and he's going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So this is talking about John. Verse 21, Peter seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So not only do we look forward, but Jesus is saying here, focus on what the task that you have to do. Right? See, Peter here is wondering, hey, what are you going to have John to do? And look at Jesus' response. Jesus saith unto him, If I will, that means if he wants, he's saying, If I want that he tarry till I come. What is he saying? If he wanted John to live until Jesus returns, he says, what does that matter to you? Right? And then if you read the rest of the chapter, a lot of people thought that Jesus said that John would live until Jesus comes back. But then he's telling people in his gospel, in the gospel of John, it's, he just says, if I will, that he tarry. He didn't actually tell us. So it sounds like John's writing his gospel because people got the wrong idea and he made sure he wrote in his gospel, no, I'm not going to live for, until Jesus comes back. Jesus just said, if I wanted him to, what is that to Peter? Follow thou me. So we focus on our own task. We look forward. We don't want to let our past, past discourage us, our past mistakes, our shortcomings, or our failings. Right? Lamentations 3, and I always think of this when we talk about starting over, starting afresh, starting new. Let's just start now. Maybe you've done wrong in the past. Maybe you failed in the past. But today, just start again and do right and try your best from this time forward. Lamentations 3.22 is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Look at this. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Man, if only we treated one another like God treats us. Gives us a fresh start. Gives us a new chance, another chance. Every morning is another chance to try and get right, to do what's right. But we don't. As, as human beings, our flesh, we get bitter. We hold grudges. We don't let people live past their mistakes. But we ought to. You know, if somebody is trying to do right, they're repentant, they're trying to move forward, they've apologized, you need to let it go. Right? You need to be like the Lord. You need to forgive. Right? And be, have, have compassion, like it says here in verse 22. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. This is a great verse, <clears throat> you know, to remind yourself. You know, you've uh, done something wrong. You know, you've fallen into sin, or you've willfully jumped into sin. 
Or, you know, you just failed in an area that you, you wanted to do more. You know, I always uh, think of this first, that, you know, God is not up in heaven, just like, you know, making you feel guilty about all the things you've done. You know, if you confess it to God, it's done. His compassion, His mercy is new every morning. Every day is a new day where you can keep moving forward and doing great things for God. Keep serving. So, put God first. God comes first. Look forward, right? Don't focus on the past. Focus on the future. Number three is have, be diligent. Have diligent goals. Proverbs 10. There's a lot the Bible says about being diligent, right? And it compares it. What's the opposite of diligence? Well, you'll see in these verses. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. There's Proverbs. There's some great Proverbs here. Proverbs 12, verse 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. I was reading this passage last night and it just reminds me, I was just like, man, I got to do some more stuff political because it's just like, we don't do enough. And I just feel like, yeah, see, at least, at least the lefties and all the bloody communists out there, at least they're being diligent and that's why they're bearing rule. But the slothful, us, they just complain about who things are and uh, just go about living our own life in pleasure. The slothful shall be under tribute. Increase taxes. Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard desire that hath nothing. I want you to keep this verse in mind as I talk about goals. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. Right? The lazy person wants everything, but they don't have anything. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Proverbs 21. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of every one that is hasty only to Want. So we want to be diligent, right? Diligent in our goals. Have you ever heard the difference between a goal and a dream? Uh, this is uh, setting smart goals. You know, people say a lot of people have dreams, they don't have goals. What's the difference? Well, because a goal is something specific, right? A dream is just, it's not specific at all. Like, like saying, I want to lose weight. Yeah, that's a dream, right? But a goal is something that is smart. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. This is just like in business they teach. But I think it's actually pretty cool how they have, uh, um, when you talk about goal setting, and they say you should make smart goals, right? Smart, so they need to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So what's a goal? A goal should have all five of these elements. And it's like if, you, if they don't have these elements, then a lot of people will say, well, that's just a dream you have. If you just have a dream, that doesn't... You know, that's why it reminds me of this passage. Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul is like a desire that had nothing. They just have dreams. They just think, yeah, I want this, I want that, I want to lose weight, I want to be successful, I want to have a lot of money, I want to accomplish all these things. But then if you have actually no goals, if you don't actually set some sort of plan in order to attain the things that you want, then there's nothing more than a dream. So when you set goals, you want to think about smart goals. You want to be specific. So let's say, let's give an example, right? Let's say... Um, Somebody goes, ah, oh, the new year, I want to know God better. I want to know God better. That sounds great, right? That's just a dream, because it's like it's not a goal. Because how are you actually going to, how are you going to know God better, right? Well, it's specific. So you might say, well, I, oh, that's right. So you say, well, I am going to, to, in order to know God better, I'm going to read through the Bible in one year by following a daily Bible reading plan. So you get a Bible reading plan and you read through it. You say every day I'm going to read through some of it. I'm going to read through my Bible in a year. So it's specific, right? It's not just vague. That's what the S stands for. It's measurable. Why? Because you can see whether or not every day you're reading that allotted portion. And if you don't, you can adjust and say, okay, well, I dropped it there, but then I can keep going. I can see whether I'm actually doing. And if you can measure it, then you know when, you, when you're going to get there. Right? Rather than just something nebulous that's immeasurable. Is it attainable? This is saying, is it realistic? Some people might say, well, I want to read through my Bible. I'm going to do it in a month. Yeah. So it's, just like, it's unreasonable. It's not attainable. Right? So you want something that's reasonable based on your schedule. That's attainable. Relevant. Obviously, reading the Bible might be relevant, but you know, when they talk about these things in business, they say relevant because you may have an action that you're doing and it doesn't actually achieve one of the goals in your business. Like It doesn't actually increase revenue. So you, you may have things in your life that you're doing, 
but they're not actually achieving the goals that you want, right? So this is where you, it makes you reflect on, is this something I should even be spending time on, right? Is this actually achieving something that I need to, is that at the top of my priorities? And then time-based, so you know that there's a certain time you're trying to reach it by, because if there's no time goal, then you don't know whether you've actually hit that. So I think this is a really cool way to, to think about when, hey, when I'm gonna sit down and think about what I wanna do, what I wanna achieve, is it smart, right? Is it specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based? And then you, should, you ought to have smart goals. And this is, I think this is, you know, just some of the world's wisdom, right? Like just wisdom of, you know, just practical wisdom when it comes to being diligent, right? Are you, do you have diligent goals or do you just have dreams? Like another example might be losing weight. People say, oh, I want to lose weight. Well, that's just a dream. So how would you turn that into a goal? You say, well, I'm going to lose weight. You might say, I want to be specific. I'm going to reduce one size of clothing. Because right? I, I think that, personally, if you know much about losing weight, that's a better way to gauge whether you're losing weight than just the scale. Right? Because the scale, you, you can just be like, not drink. You know, it's like the UFC fighters. They just like, don't drink any water. And then they lose like, you know, two kilos or whatever. You know? So you don't want to, I don't think it's healthy to necessarily go by the scale. I think it's better to gauge whether you're losing weight by your clothing size. Because some people, they just starve themselves and then they're just losing all their muscle mass and muscle is what makes you heavier than fat. So you're like losing kilograms, but then you're just like losing muscle. And you're, you know, maybe you're not drinking enough water or you didn't drink any water that day, so you have hardly any water in your system. But you're actually not healthy even though you're losing weight. So you want to lose weight healthily, you want to build muscle, be healthy, exercise, eat properly. And I think if you gauge by you know, the firmness of your body and then the, the, the size of your clothing, if you're losing weight, it's probably a better way to do it. So let's say a goal is, you know, lose weight by, you reduce the size by doing like a specified workout routine each day for six months. You know, so you have a time base, it's, it's attainable, you know, depending on what that specified workout is, but then, you, you know, that's something you've got to work out. So diligent goals, that's number three. Number four, it's two more. So we've got put God first, look forward, don't focus on the past, have diligent goals. Number four is obvious, but always a good reminder, is once you set that plan, you've got to do it. You know, there's no point like, you know, setting a plan and then thinking about what you're going to do and then not actually doing any of the things that you write down, right? <laughs> you actually got to do the things that you want to do, right? If you want to actually make some change in your life, you want to do something for God, well, what are you doing different? I mean, if you want, I mean, reflect on last year. All right, that's enough time for you guys to reflect on last year. You reflect on last year. I don't know, were you happy with what you accomplished last year? No. Did you feel like you achieved everything you could have achieved? Did you feel like you wasted too much time? I mean, you know, maybe you did. Maybe you, you, you did do good. So then you can reflect and say, I did good. I did the same thing this year. Well, if, but if you're, you are not satisfied with last year, you know you could do more for God last year. If you don't do anything different this year, it's just going to be the same. Like people say, insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. So if you don't do anything different, nothing's going to change. You've got to be a doer. It's the same spiritually, it's the same practically. James 1. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continuing, continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So you've got to do. You can't just hear. It's like today. You just hear, you don't change anything, you're going to forget this sermon. Right, but do something about it. 1 John 3, look, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We've got to be a doer, not just a planner. One way you can do it is you have like a, you use a prioritized to-do list. You know, if you're the type of person that doesn't write things down, I, you know, that's not good. 
<laughs> you know, you, 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 I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's a quote out there somewhere. I've read it before that, you know, like, you're a fool if you depend on your memory. You know, like, most people, I, I write a lot of things down. You know, use it, you got, everyone's got, like, a notes app on their phone. You should use it. You know, you got your reminders app, write a to-do list. Write things down. Don't depend on your memory. That's why I love, like, you know, apps like Evernote. You know, you got notes on iOS. I don't know what the Android version is. I don't care. <laughs> I'm an Apple fanboy. But, you know, you use notes, and it's great, because if you forget, you can always search it. So if you're, like, a paper person, I know, like, my wife and I talk about this all the time. Like, people just, like, write things down. I would recommend, you know, you, you utilize technology and try, start using the notes app or something that's searchable. Because you know what? If you keep a notepad and everything, you write all that stuff down, but then how do you search it? You gotta go back and flip, you gotta flip through it all and find, where did I write that note? Where did I... But if you, if you use an app and you write it all down somewhere, you can search it and you can remind yourself. And then you don't have to only depend on your memory or make you a lot more productive. So use a prioritized to-do list. What do I do? You write out a to-do list and then you prioritize it. You put the things that are most important first. And then you work from top to bottom. And that makes sure you get things done. You get the most important things done first. Because you may have something that you want to do. And after you prioritize it, it's all the way at the bottom. So then at least you know you're not wasting time doing things that are less important than other things. So use a prioritized to-do list. And one thing, when, when, when you talk about being a doer, and, and I definitely like suffer from this, but... You, you, need to be, you need to be a doer because you need to be aware of like, paralysis by analysis. You know, you'll never have everything right. You'll never have everything in order. you just got to start doing things. It's the same with soul winning. People think, oh, once I learn, once I know everything, uh, then I'll go and do that. No, you just start. And you learn by doing. Right? You can't, you know, you can't just know everything before you do something. And I say this to myself because... You know, this is why I probably don't do as much as I do, because I'm always thinking about just making it exactly perfect, and, you know, you just got to start doing. Learn by doing. Don't learn everything before you do. Everything you did the first time, it was weird and scary, right? But now you're an expert at it. And it's the same in every area of life, right? It applies to spiritual work as much as it does to secular work. We got to do and not only plan. Planning is important, but you don't want paralysis by analysis. So just start doing. It doesn't have to be perfect. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Okay? So put God first. Look forward. Diligent goals. Make sure you're a doer. And the last one I want you to think about today is have focus. Have focus. All right? What do I mean by this? Well, let's read Ecclesiastes 7. Verse 15, all things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Be not righteous overmuch, neither make thyself overwise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? So what am I talking about when I talk about have focus? Is don't spread yourself too thin. And we're talking about all the things we want to accomplish. This is why I think it's important that you take some time to plan. You know, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. You heard that one? So you've got to sit down and plan and think about what you want to achieve and write these things down so that you're not spreading yourself too thin or you're not just doing impulsively at the moment what you want to do and then you end up really accomplishing nothing great because you're just all over the place. Right? You need to have some focus. So not only you may need to reduce the scope of what you do so you can get further in the things that you do, right? Because no successful person just spreads themselves too thin. I mean, when you, you, you watch, you listen to successful people, they say, you know, there are things that you may want to do that you can't do. You've got to cut down. You're probably, I remember listening to this one seminar once where the guy said, write down all the things you want to do and accomplish. Order them from, like, you know, one, you know from most important to least important. And then he said, like, Take the top three things and then just cross out everything else because you're not going to be able to do the rest of them well. You know? So you're only going to be able to do a few things really well. So decide what those top things are going to be and then ditch the rest. Right? And remember, God, like I said, remember God always comes first. Something has to be done for God. 
Hebrews tells us not only can our scope sometimes be too wide, but sometimes we have things that hold us back. Hebrews 12.1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Look at this. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the Bible likens our run, our spiritual life, our run in the Christian life as a race. And it's saying here, hey, we need to lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So what does that mean? We need to focus on running the race and not get distracted by other things. We need to have some focus. This is what we're talking about in point number five. So what does lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us? Because sometimes sin holds you back. You know, if you've got some sin that you're struggling with or sin that you're diving into all the time, that's going to hold you back from doing great things for God. You need to try and get that sin out of your life. And you know what? You don't get it out and then start serving. Oftentimes when you start serving God and you start doing what's right, God starts purging you and helping you to get your sin out of your life. Because, here's, because the trick to getting sin out of your life is not just the sheer willpower of not doing it. What you've got to do is you've got to replace it with something good. You know, how do you not walk in the flesh? Well, you need to walk in the spirit. You don't just like willfully go, I will not walk in the flesh. Right? The trick to it is the more you walk in the spirit, the less power the flesh is going to have over you. So, right, how do you get rid of sin? Well, you start trying to do things that are righteous. You force yourself to do it. You keep doing it. The more you do it, the more you learn, the more you grow, the less desire you're going to have to sin, right? Because you're going to be distracted with something else. And every weight, because sometimes the things that keep us back is not only sin. Sometimes it's just vain things in our lives. Just too many vain things, too many activities, too many things we want to do. We need to reduce that scope and have some focus. Right? So think about are you spreading yourself too thin? Don't spread yourself too thin because you don't want to be, you know, a jack of all trades and a master of none. Just realize, you know, you can't do everything. And to be a dedicated practitioner of anything, it requires sacrifice, right? So to be a dedicated Christian, it requires sacrifice. You know, like a lot of new believers, they say, oh, you know, I've got to go to church on Sunday, but I like to go to the beach on Sunday. I like to do my shopping on Sunday. Well, if you want to be a good Christian, it's going to require some changes in your life. It's going to require some sacrifice. Just like being a parent requires some sacrifice. You know, you can't raise and spend time with your children and still live the same life that you used to live. You know, when you were single, yeah, you could just go out whenever you want and do this and do that and just, you know, do all the activities, all the things you wanted to do. But when you're a parent, it's different now. Now you've got children that you have to raise. You've got to spend time with them. Your, your priorities are going to change. You're going to have to make some sacrifice. You're going to have to live a little bit different to how you lived before. Right, a lot different. Because to be good at anything, right, it requires sacrifice and focus. I wanted to share this, uh, this quote for you from uh, a famous Asian man. It's not me. But I thought it was pretty cool because when I think about focus, I thought this was very interesting. He says, so Bruce Lee, I don't know, maybe some of the young kids, I don't think my kids know who Bruce Lee is, <laughs> but most of you guys know who Bruce Lee is. He says, I fear not the man. Look at this. I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. So this is a quote talking about focus. Right? So it's the same, I think, in our Christian life. Right? Like, I don't think the devil fears the person that's just done a million things once, and just scattered, running around with their head off. But a man that's focused right, and becoming an expert in spiritual matters, that's somebody that's formidable. Right? So, in conclusion, five things I want you to think about. Or well, six, really, to include the introduction. Life is short, isn't it? So we need to, when we set goals, make sure God comes first. We look forward. Be diligent in your goals. Make sure you do them. And have focus. Don't spread yourself too thin. And I want to just circle back to introduction, just end on this last passage. Hebrews 9, verse 27. As it is appointed unto men... 
once to die, but after this, the judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. You know, you only die once. It means you only live once. You know, life is short. So don't waste your life. You know, it's ticking away every day. Okay, so make sure your life accomplishes something for God. Because, you know, when you get into eternity, and if all you've done is just wood, hay, and stubble, it's all going to be burnt up if you just live for yourself. So you have one life, use it wisely. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, thank you for this life that you've given us. Um, we take it for granted, Lord. We complain about life. But the mere fact that we get to breathe today uh, is, a, is a blessing from you. So, Lord, we thank you for this life you've given us. Uh, Lord, um, help us to use this life to serve you. If not, even if for your benefit, not just for you, Lord, even though that's the reason why we should be doing it, but for our own benefit, Lord. Because when we get to eternity, um, the things that we do of eternal value are all, is all that's going to matter. So, uh, Lord, we thank you that you know, you've set years in place so we can reflect on uh, life. Uh, Lord, I pray for the people in this room. I pray that they do it before their life is over. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.